Um, so yes, we're going to be talking about libraries, readers, and distraction today, and hopefully pretty interactive. So um, like I'll, I'll talk for the first part here. And uh, like uh, like Susan already mentioned, uh, my background was in tech, um, interestingly. So just to give this a time frame, I did work at Authors at Google. It was a great job. It was, um, I actually really enjoyed what I did. Um, working with the major publishers would send me free books and say, "Who? what books would you like to have book events? Would you like to invite Salman Rushdie to come to the office? And you know, Buzz Aldrin and Hillary Clinton, all these things. So that was fun to get free books from the publishers. Um, I was also on the scene at the very beginning of the Google Book Scanning Project, which I know uh, most people would be familiar with. Uh, the machines did not look like this. It was just an old uh, uh, vacuum cleaner, essentially rigged up vacuum cleaner with a, a bicycle handlebar sort of thing that would turn the pages. But obviously they're still doing book scanning sort of things. Um, and my current research, um, works on my PhD in education at the University of uh, Cambridge um, uh, here. And then I'm interested, so this is part of the reason I'm talking to you today because this I speak from experience, both uh, professional and um, academic in terms of our reading habits online. What happens between uh, going from page to screen, printed page to screen? What, what is the experience of reading like? How do, what's the role of social media affect our, you know, our attention span, our distractions and these sort of things. So I thought I would apply some of those findings um, and some of the things that I've heard about over the years uh, to all of you today, and we can kind of facilitate a discussion. I'm going to cover a lot of stuff um, relatively, like as a kind of like a wide view of things. Um, this is just, uh, I mean, this has been my life for the past half decade, so it's kind of hard for me to stop talking. I'm going to take advantage of social media in this case. So I'm going to use my Twitter as the footnotes for today's talk. So anything that I mention that has an article or a link or a book or something, I will share it online later too. No need to... Um, uh, try to uh, multitask, which I'm going to talk about in a second, to get all of these things down um, or share. Uh, feel free to grab those later. So anything that, that is linkable, I will mention um, over Twitter, and I'll get those online for everyone to get later today. I'm aware of the irony, the digital distraction of using social media for a talk on digital distraction, but um, life is ironic sometimes. So let's go with it. Um, all right. So I thought I would like go back in time a little bit. How did I get interested in this um, uh, this topic. And I thought I would just share um, this quote, uh, Nicholas Carr, this comes from Nicholas Carr's The Shallows. And I read this while I was still at Google. Um, so it's, uh, I'll just read it out loud. It'll um, be quick enough that if we're thinking, we're not thinking the way, I'm not thinking the way I used to think. I feel it most strongly when I'm reading. I used to find it easy to immerse myself in a book or a lengthy article. That's rarely the case anymore. Now my concentration starts to drift after a page or two. I get fidgety, lose the thread, begin looking for something else to do. The deep reading that used to come naturally has become a struggle. So he was a science writer, still is a science writer, but someone who reads and writes for a living. Um, that is ultimately what led me to my path to Cambridge is reading this book because I found this to be true myself. Um, like a lot of you, um, I'm a very bookish person. And I found when working in Silicon Valley in the tech world, I was spending a lot of time on screen. Um, and not much time reading books for fun. Um, it was just everything was online. And I felt like I felt it after I started to realize it, that something was missing and that I just wasn't reading the way I was used to. So I started to really wonder about this. Um, I thought I would just share, it's a good overview of many things, um, but kind of fast forwarding to the present, uh, I wonder about, so most of this talk is on distraction. The idea of like, you know, the question I posted on Twitter for anyone that still wants to take the poll, can we, can we still get lost in a good book on a screen? Um, you know, there are distractions, uh, distracted from distraction by distraction. I won't take credit for that. That's T.S. Eliot. Um, but there is a poll today. It was kind of interesting. This is totally unscientific, but I thought it was just kind of neat to see, like, you know, um, in case you'd like to register your thoughts, your experience, um, your preferred way to get lost in a book. And by that, I mean like the immersion, the flow kind of process. So um, we've got, uh, you know, print is still overwhelmingly in our crowd and the people that saw this on Twitter, the preference, um, a good number of not sure or no preference. Um, I'm curious about this, that it's the no preference part and some of the research that I've been doing. Um, are we gonna become more medium agnostic over time? And that's the idea that maybe we'll have no preference. Maybe the best book experience is the one that we can access, maybe. It's not going anywhere. We're past that stage of those discussions, but um, it's interesting to see uh, kind of like, you know, where, where there is a little bit of flux in these sort of things. Um, for me personally, if I had to answer, I still prefer 
print uh, just because it gives my eyeballs a break. We've all got digital fatigue at this point. Uh, sometimes I do prefer a Kindle at night when going to sleep. Um, the, the Kindle light setting, depending on which one you have, um, is, is, a, is much preferred over any of the blue light emitting devices. If we're going to read something in the dark before bedtime, um, Kindle is the way to go. So I have my nighttime reading, hence why I'm reading the uh, George Orwell, Orwell book uh, right before bedtime. Um, a little bit of um, situating of context, because that's what we do in research and academics and these sort of things. I'm just going to touch on this briefly, but uh, when we talk about distractions and reading technology of all of these things, it's all relative. Um, I'll post a link to this later if you're curious, but um, I like, and this is just one example out of many, but the idea that, um, you know, we have the book wheel, the book wheel in the 1700s. So that was um, like the Atlantic calls it, the, uh, the Kindle of the 16th century. How could you read all these different books at once or have access to all of them? The idea was basically take two tables and stick a bunch of books in between them and put it on a wheel. So we've come a long way since then. Um, but the reason I bring this up, the idea of like technology and the idea of reading behaviors now is that, yeah, it's so contextual, right? There's another one that I'll share, but um, this is one of many examples that novel reading, Charles Dickens reading, or all of these things was considered, you know, we're talking Victorian era, this, this was bad for our attention spans, the, uh, the cliffhanger ending, or, um, you know, heaven forbid, putting pictures or something in a book was considered very distracting. So that was the Victorian era version of what we're hearing now. And uh, for anyone that's kind of looked into this or has heard some of these things, it's kind of, it's really interesting to see how, if you just switch out the terms, um, the same debates are happening then uh, happening now as they were 300 years ago, 200, 200 to 300 years ago. So again, let me, let me talk a little bit about uh, distractions on the individual level. And like I said, it's a little bit of you know relativity going on here. Uh, distraction, distraction sensitivity, I guess, the best way to put it is it's again, it's, it's hard to uh, make blanket statements because everyone is a little different. Some people prefer the, the kind of like background noise of a coffee shop, which I used to remember when coffee shops were used to be a thing. I really enjoyed going to coffee shops and reading a book um, in print or digital format. Some of us are very um, sensitive to background sounds. So the idea that like we like total silence when we read um, and different times a day. That's the other thing that we're noticing too, is that um, some of it is temporal in the sense that uh, some of us, depending on our chronotype, which is a fancy way of saying, like, are we a morning person or a night person? We're just more focused or more distractible at various, time, various times of the day. Um, so there's a lot of factors here, but I thought I would talk a little bit about um, digital distractions themselves kind of in our everyday life, and we'll kind of broaden it out to the role of readers and libraries. Um, so this is just one statistic. I grabbed this from a talk that I attended. Uh, Leanne Kerlin is one of the, uh, the research scientists at BBC, and she cited, this is one number amongst many, but the idea that, um, you know, we pick up our phone, and keep in mind this was about a year ago, uh, we pick up our phones or devices about 150 times a day. Um, just within the adult demographic, we're talking about close to four hours. Um, teens are close to double that. Um, since lockdown and since so much of our lives, um, such a portion of our lives is done through work and uh, work and play on screen. Um, I strongly suspect the numbers are up since then. Uh, 150 is a lot. Uh, 150 is like, you know, and like the idea, what counts as a digital distraction? I'll talk about kind of like a, um, a hierarchy of distractions a little bit, but even just like the simple act of like picking up your phone just to see if there are notifications, that's a pickup that counts as a pickup. And, something that we do probably half consciously at this point. I thought I would talk about very briefly noticing that, and again, this is the tech side of me coming up, but um, digital distractions and why we're so digitally distracted, 100% intentional. Um, I mean, all of the tech companies have an army of engineers and PhDs in psychology and user experience to decide this is the shade of red that is gonna make you wanna click on that thing. Everything is intentional. I mean, like, you know, this is, Probably goes without saying, especially if you've seen documentaries like um, the, the Social Dilemma and all of these things. But the idea is to kind of not, um, digital distraction has kind of picked up more of a moral uh, charge lately. And it's sort of like, I have a bad attention span. I have a good attention span. I'm not anti-digital distraction. And I think we need to give ourselves a break because we are spending all of our time online. Just understanding some of the mechanisms in ourselves, in our readers, um, is usually a good first step. But kind of realizing that there are different degrees. Um, some of us respond to kind of like, you know, if something feels urgent. Um, the one thing that um, 
I'm researching more and I'm very interested in. So this started at Google. This is the idea. If you've ever used um, Twitter, Reddit, TikTok, YouTube, all these things, it's called infinite scroll, right? So that's the idea. This, this was originally designed to make web pages load faster. So rather than having to go through clicks and taps and all of that, the content would just keep going effectively forever for our purposes. Social media companies and other types of um, uh, other types of content providers nowadays have uh, really mastered this. Um, I wonder about this one. When I said all digital distractions aren't necessarily equal, I find this one particularly um, particularly mind numbing, I guess. And I'm not anti that either, but I, I strongly suspect that there's a correlation between the amount of time we spend on infinite scroll and how we feel afterwards. Because at some point we do zone out and we're just kind of doing this um, intermittent reinforcement box thing with it. And it's like bad, bad, bad. I'm not even looking or paying attention. Why am I still on this after all of this time? So some are different. For some of us, you know, news itself is a distraction. For me personally, it's phone calls. Um, I hate phone calls, like being interrupted by phone calls if I'm working on something important. Um, I just, I, that's part of uh, life in lockdown. I just don't answer phone calls now until later. It's like, oh, email me or uh, get to me later. Um, everyone's got their different things, right? Everyone's got their different distraction threshold for what is considered somewhat distraction or very distracting. So there's a little bit of nuance when we talk about digital distraction. Um, what does it have to do with reading and reading behaviors? So again, there's a lot of debate kind of ongoing about some of these things. I'm curious in your perspective, working with readers and working in libraries and these sort of things, um, we've seen a number of things and this is still kind of an ongoing thing. Marion Wolf, who's one of my favorite researchers and authors, um, I believe she's at UCLA now, um, I think, uh, as a visiting researcher, but she's a neuroscientist. She wrote Proust and the Squid. And uh, you may have seen this Guardian article from um, a little while ago in terms of like, are we doing more skim reading? Are our attention spans um, by default kind of a uh, little shorter because um, there's so much to read that we're just trying to get through it. Um, another Guardian article, this is a while ago, but on the one hand we have, um, is it making us more shallow readers like Nicholas Carr talked about in his book in the beginning. On the other hand, there's the idea that, well, it actually isn't harming deep reading. Um, there are different ways to look at this. This is the, I'll share, again, I'll share both of these articles because I think it is good food for thought to um, think about and respond to. Um, I think we both encounter various versions of it in our everyday lives. So this is a cartoon. I really like this cartoon. Um, this is the one that kind of summarizes Marion Wolf's thesis um, in a little bit. Um, a lot of us have heard uh, TLDR, too long didn't read. Um, unfortunately, that's become uh, more salient the longer we go. Um, cause we're in a tension span economy, right? We're in a idea where like one of our limits is not access to stuff so much as it is like, you know, what's worth our time. So this cartoon kind of humorously, but also like fairly on the nose describes some of these things. It's, it's very short. We still didn't read it. I should read it. Should. I think this a lot myself probably won't read it, but I'll keep it in a bookmark or I'll keep it on my, um, uh, you know, bookmarking service things, read a bit, got bored, skim read, totally missed the point see this on Twitter a lot, a lot, uh, read the headline, posted angry comments. Oh boy. Um, yeah. So there, there's a little bit of that. Like this is kind of the, the what's at stake when we talk about dis, uh, distractions and attenuated attention spans and readers and all of these things. It's a humorous way to uh, describe some of these things, but um, also a fairly accurate representation of reality in some ways. So we see all of this. You might've noticed for those of you that use Twitter, that they're rolling out the feature in terms of uh, if you share an article, there's a little prompt now that'll come up. Did you actually read the article? Would you like to read the article before you share it? Which is generally a good practice. Um, anyways, that should be more of a thing. So it's interesting to see tech companies doing that. Multitasking is the other part. I'd be curious about uh, like if we have a conversation towards the end here, um, there's a lot to say about multitasking. Specifically, I'm interested in this in the context of reading and studying. Um, we all multitask at various times. Um, we might be multitasking right now during this talk. Um, in general, uh, we're all I mean, multitasking really is closer to task switching. Uh, task switching is the idea that we jump quickly back and forth between different things. Listen to this talk, reply to this email, um, you know, posting this thing online. Um, and it's become, I feel like it's become easier since lockdown, since everything is online. I feel like that's true. Um, I've done it. 
Uh, and I try to limit myself to it just because the, the science is fairly clear at this point. We're all much worse at any two tasks that we switch between than we would on a single task that we could focus on. They've done studies. Um, this is just one example of many um, where they had students, you know, reading and studying for a thing. They could go about five or six minutes um, in between tasks before they had to check something, any kind of digital distraction, a, a text or these sort of things. Um, those were students. Those of us our age um, were not much better. I think we were in the eight or nine minute range, so we can't blame um, younger generations so much. Um, there are different ones. In case anyone's more interested in kind of the science behind some of these things, I think this is fascinating, but there's a very small percentage of the population um, who can apparently effectively multitask and do things equally as well. Statistically speaking, it's tiny, so it's probably not me, but it's probably not you. Well, this is a big group, maybe like one or two of you, maybe, but I wouldn't take that chance. So when you, we know when it comes to multitasking and learning and all of these things that um, it's a bad deal for us, productivity and thought-wise for what exactly it is we're doing. I'll post those things online. Uh, these are just passing thoughts. Um, the idea, since we're talking about audiobooks um, over Twitter a little bit, just before this talk started, I get this question a lot in terms of attention span. Um, you know, how do we improve our attention span? There's multiple ways to do it. Um, my shorthand answer is um, try audiobooks. Like if there, there are some people who, um, you know, fully say that I can't focus on a book for five minutes if my life depended on it, but, um, and if, not a, that's not like a bad thing so much as like these are habits that um, we've learned in terms of multitasking and digital distractions. But the great thing is we can unlearn those habits as well. Um, I like audiobooks. I think a good audiobook um, would be uh, like a, as good a way as any to kind of like immerse yourself and get lost in a good book that way. Um, it depends, of course. I think a good narrator makes all the difference. I wish Neil Gaiman narrated more books. If I was super rich, I would pay him to narrate everything. Um, so a good narrator makes all the difference. Um, in general, they, oops, in general, they say science fiction and fantasy tend to be the genres that most promote getting lost because there's a lot of world building, of course, and a lot of, um, you know, uh, uh, vivid detail that helps. Um, for me, for whatever reason, Charles Dickens has been my uh, thing lately, long audiobooks, but um, I don't know. It just kind of works for me when it terms of lots of characters, also world building, of course. Um, this applies to nonfiction as well. Everyone's a little different, but that's my short term. Um, there, there could be a whole talk about attention span and these sort of things, but like kind of rediscovering the pleasure of getting lost in a good book in an audio book um, uh, or while listening to an audio book while you might be doing other things like exercise or taking a walk um, nowadays. Uh, very briefly, I thought I would mention some of these things since I was just talking about multitasking. Um, often um, uh, when we're talking, reading and uh, writing go hand to hand. Uh, there's been some stuff that, uh, some studies that have shown, and I tend to agree with this, that uh, uh, typing, typing tends to turn us into uh, stenographer, turns to tend us into um, kind of like transcription writers more than actual note takers. Um, so sometimes slower is better, I found. Um, for meetings in general now, I've actually switched back to paper because I feel like it helps me pay attention better. It helps me be able to say like, oh, um, that guy's talking really fast. Um, I'm not gonna be able to type, uh, write down all of these things, but I got the, the gist of it. Paper good, typing bad, all right, whatever, et cetera, these sort of things. Uh, and I mentioned the kind of slowness, which is kind of, um, Something that me 10 years ago in Silicon Valley would have thought was kind of silly, actually. Um, all of the affordances that are built into, um, you know, a lot of the digital things, the fact that we can look up links um, to Wikipedia and um, hyperlink and jump into different search windows and all of that isn't always a good thing for the reading experience. Um, for distraction, and I mean distraction both in the reading sense and really a lot of the work that we do on an everyday basis. I'm pro to this. The, uh, uh, oh, let me look that up or let me research this. Um, I usually write these things down just to like help with my focus and not get pulled down too many different directions at the same time. Um, I'll keep a little post-it or a little thing and um, I use it as my, my um, information triage, my distraction triage system. I found that about half the time, I didn't really want to look it up. Um, it's just the novelty that like our brains kind of crave the novelty and we do want it. We distract ourselves where it's like, oh, this feels important in the moment. It's actually not important. So half the time, I would say when I write something down, I was like, look up this or what does that mean? 
Um, 10, 30 minutes later, uh, I'm, I'm fairly consistently seeing that I was like, oh, I don't really care about that. It's just the idea that like, there's some part of this, like an itchy part of our brain, which does want to be distracted and jump into a different topic. So that's the idea. Sometimes slower is better. Um, let's talk about some of the interesting stuff here, and then we'll open up the discussion a little bit. Um, I'm fascinated by kind of the temporal element that's like kind of come into a lot of reading time. And again, this goes back to what I said, there's so much to read and not enough time to do it that we're seeing things like on media and all sorts of different things. You're getting estimated reading times um, basically to help you make an informed decision. A lot of things are doing this. I'm seeing this more in mainstream publications too. So um, it's the, uh, you know, is this worth my time to read it? Um, quantifying the reading experience is a hard thing to do. The tech and data part of me would have loved this. Um, and I still find it kind of interesting in terms of like indicators of something, right? How much time we're spending on something. Um, reading experience is a very complicated thing to understand. Um, I like, uh, one of, this is one of my favorite books, by the way, If on a Winter's Night a Traveler by Italo Calvino. Super weird, super metafiction, but great. Um, but it talks about the reading experience in a really um, sensible way. It's the idea that um, you know, reading, uh, the idea of reading, the experience of reading is always this, that there is a thing that is there, a thing made out of writing, a solid material object, which cannot be changed. And through this thing, we measure ourselves against some, something else that is not present, something else that belongs to the immaterial, invisible world, because it can only be thought, imagined, or because it was once and is no longer, no longer past, lost or unattainable. Um, and really, the idea behind that is just that there is this kind of intangibility of the reading experience. Like, you know, we've seen studies nowadays where um, they stick grad students in an MRI tube and have them read Jane Austen. It's like, all right, so that's one way to get in the sense of like what's going on in there when we're reading. Um, it's a lot harder uh, in terms of like, you know, the data can only take us so far, right? I'm going to come back to this in a second. But the idea of like, how do we do this? How do we really capture what's going on? Um, during the experience of reading, um, a click can only tell us, uh, it tells us something, certainly. Um, and that's why I've been kind of thinking about textbooks. This was actually going to be in my original research because my background was in digital textbooks before coming to Cambridge. Um, there's a lot of potential here. I'll share this one from Junko and Clem about the, uh, um, you know, kind of the, the learning outcomes or some suggestions of learning outcomes through textbook uh, uh, metrics data. Um, I think some of you probably are already um, doing some of these things. You can see like checkouts, where are people dropping off, um, users reading these sort of things. Things like CourseSmart, for instance, give a very uh, granular approach to these sort of things, number of minutes spent on it. So it's something. It's data, but what do we do with this data? Um, that is the question that interests me right now. Oops. That is the question that interests me right now. Um, the you, you may or may not have seen this. Um, the uh, uh, the thing from, so I'm from Los Angeles originally, but this was a big one, one of the biggest school districts in the, um, uh, in the United States, second biggest, Los Angeles Unified School District. Basically, the idea was let's spend a billion dollars on iPads and this will help education and learning outcomes with no other plan. That was the plan. Um, they lost a lot of money from that. They didn't lose the whole billion, fortunately, but um, that's one of the things I'm interested in. So it's not just the data and usage stuff. It's actually the everything that goes around making these kind of decisions. Um, yeah, that was horrible. That was basically, I was so mad about this that I wanted to get a PhD, um, was to actually like try to prevent these sort of things from happening. Again, these kind of like crazy decisions about like, well, tech isn't in itself, digital isn't enough. You know, tech isn't enough on its own. It's the kind of people stuff that goes into it behind it. Um, again, Silicon Valley, me never would have said those words, but it's true. Um, there are different ways to do this. I'm particularly interested in um, Jelly Books, if anyone's heard of this. They're based in London. Um, I'll share this article in case anyone is interested, but it is basically analytics for um, reading and these sort of things. We have different ways we can get this information now, but this takes books um, that you could read on like a Kindle or a, um, you know any commercially bought reading device, and it can kind of get a sense, a reading profile. So the little blue um, bars in this case are kind of like uh, like reading sessions, longer bars or longer amounts of time reading. Um, how often did they pick up the book? And I was like, all right, so um, hypothetically in this graph that we're looking at below, um, nothing on weekends, um, looks like weekend evenings or later in the day tend to be popular times for reading these sort of things. But again, it's information. It like paints some kind of picture or the outlines of the picture when it comes to reading behavior and all of these things. I find it fascinating. Um, 
of a little bit more to say about this as we get through the next few slides. Um, paradoxically, my favorite reading app is not a reading app at all. Um, it's an anti-distraction app. Um, I really like this one called Freedom. There are other ones, but the idea is that you can set um, uh, time limits. You can set limits to the amount of time you spend on an app or a website. You can also block out the internet in, um, entirely, which is exactly what I do. Um, it's the, the best way I've ever heard it described was um, in the Odyssey, when Odysseus um, is going through the, uh, uh, like, knows he's going to be lured by the sirens. Uh, this is the 21st century version of that, that knowing that we're going to be distracted by things ahead of time, we can actually plan ahead and say, like, okay, uh, you know, this is my reading time or this is my time when I'm not going to be distracted by the siren call of social media and all of these things. Um, I use it a lot. Um, I even, I like this app so much, I actually wrote a little blog post to them because they asked me to. I'll share that online in case anyone wants um, to hear how I use that specifically. So I will put that online later too. My second, second app that I thought I'd give a shout out to um, is on iOS. So any Apple device, um, Mac OS and iOS, um, I feel like it's really um, not talked about that much, but the reading shortcuts are actually pretty cool. Um, so under the shortcut menu that they introduced in the last major um, or two, two iterations ago for the iOS version, they actually have kind of like a reading mode sort of thing where it's like, okay, uh, it'll turn it into airplane mode for you. It'll open your reading app for you. And it'll like, you know, kind of keep everything quiet, turn off all the notifications until you've kind of gotten out of it. I think that's really cool. Um, I don't hear a lot of press about these sort of things. I'll share a link to the iOS reading shortcut things, but I just really like them. And um, it feels like it's not that big a deal, but I use it all the time, actually. Um, it's a good way to kind of like uh, build in quiet time for reading. Um, for our, our student readers and um, people that are trying to work on ways to kind of like, you know, foster more of that quiet reading time, I'm a big fan of Pomodoros. Um, I don't think, uh, you know, like we, we need to necessarily prioritize the kind of reading for hours straight and not moving around. Um, we do have a natural limit on our attention span sometimes. Um, depends on what it is we're reading, but knowing when to take breaks, the Pomodoro timer is basically work for a number of set minutes and then take a break, um, excuse me, distractions, whatever you want during the, um, the five minute break, but you can do this and stay relatively focused. Um, it's just one way. It's a way to kind of like a method of kind of like working within the limits of our attention span and also learning to um, increase it. If it's sort of like, yeah, I, I, I tend to not um, be able to pay attention super long, but I'd like to get a little better. So you build in um, attention span is almost, almost kind of like a, a muscle or a skill that the more you use it, the more you train it. Maybe 10 or 15 minutes of concentrated reading is hard at first, but after a month or two, all of a sudden 30 minutes of 40 minutes of concentrated reading becomes much, much easier. So anyways, it was a practical way. I thought I would share some of the apps. Um, for more on this, um, I will share some links to books that I really like in case people are interested in kind of the history of that. Natalie Phillips, when I talked about the Victorian uh, era um, uh, concerns about digital distraction, not a new thing necessarily, but it's fascinating to hear what people were worried about um, back then and kind of like the, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the, right, the new era of modern uh, modernity and all of these things. Um, a lot of similar concerns. Um, I'll share the article too, this, uh, this one about why digital devices, what's different isn't so much the questions, but the quantity certainly is different now than it was uh, back then. The fact that all of these things are so prevalent. Um, a couple more books. I mentioned Marianne Wolf and a couple of these, just in case you're interested, I'll post links to all of these books. But if this topic really piques your interest, um, these are all books that I really like. Um, uh, Marianne Wolf is a neuroscientist, but she wrote this lovely collection of kind of uh, uh, many essays on um, like, you know, reading in the brain. And she talks about biliteracy in the sense that maybe we'll all kind of be equally as comfortable with uh, screen reading, screen-based reading as print reading, possibly, maybe. Uh, uh, Naomi Barron wrote the book for OUP on the, another one that I thought was kind of interesting in terms of attention span and distractions and these sort of things. And then another thing, um, before we open up to questions, I was thinking so my program that I manage here at Cambridge is the Think Lab. We've worked at the Reading Agency before, which I really like. I think the Reading Agency is great as a nonprofit organization. Um, I can share some of the stuff that we've done with them, but I'll kind of talk about it as well um, in terms of uh, like what libraries and reading organizations can do. So basically I kind of 
uh, ran through different scenarios for them. And some of it was just thinking in terms of, I'm not, I don't think social media is antithetical to reading behavior necessarily. There are ways that a lot of reading in book organizations can get a lot of information from uh, where are your demographics going, go where your users are. That was the thing that they said at Google from the very beginning, which is super true still true today. Um, when it comes to kind of like, how do we reach our audiences? You go where they are, or go where they're spending their most time. So having an understanding of what platforms actually work well, what kind of platforms are encouraging bookish behavior. It's just something that I'm interested in, um, in case people want to chat about some of these things. Um, it's, it's one of the things on my radar to think more about. Um, I love what the New York Public Library did, for example. They took the example of, um, they took uh, Instagram stories and uh, converted a few public domain books um, into uh, like really flashy novels. They did Alice in Wonderland through Instagram. Um, it looks great. Uh, Facebook has done this too. They released a couple of books through Messenger with fictional character profiles. Um, I like seeing the experimentation. I think that's neat. And who knows where some of these things will go. Um, I'm curious about book clubs because I've seen libraries do this. The World Economic Forum is one of the ones that I've been paying attention to in terms of reaching wide varieties of readers. I think social media book clubs are a great idea, actually, like in terms of just being able to um, facilitate some of those readerly encounters in different ways. Um, so I'm just curious. I'm throwing out different topics of conversation. The other thing I would think about, too, is... Uh, we probably all have data like that's uh, part of the reason I wanted to like kind of chat with you all for the, the rest of the time too is like, what are you finding? Like, are there ways we can kind of combine some of these like pool our collective knowledge on these things and like we don't, we know some things about readerly behavior, digital distractions, attention span and all of that, but um, this is still a big question mark. Uh, I kind of want to just see, like, you know, I'm curious to learn what you're all thinking about this, what you've noticed in your roles, what kind of questions still need to be asked, and like, you know, what, what kind of future research needs to be done on this? Um, to me, it's a huge question still, even after all this time, it's something we've got to work on together. So um, I think that's it for me. I think we can open up to questions or these sort of things. So again, I'll post to Twitter, I got my email. Um, I love talking about these things. So anyone can reach me at any time. Um, yeah, anyone can reach me uh, during these things. But um, yeah, Susan, what do you think? We have questions and comments we should get to. Uh, yeah, we have some questions that are posted. So um, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for that uh, interesting talk there. And uh, there's lots of of comments and responses in the chat as well that we can take a look at. Uh, I wanted to remind people that you can post your questions, but also we are going to be interactive at this point. So if you want to join uh, Tyler and myself as the panel and verbally ask your question as opposed to writing it, um, you are able to do that. You just need to raise your hand uh, to do that. So um, I, I want, wondered if I can be a bit cheeky and just kick off with uh, one of my own questions that I had there. Um, what I was thinking about, uh, Tyler, which you were talking is that quite often there's this um, kind of value judgment, I think value in academia about close reading and deep reading, that being the academic sort of seal approval and what we should be striving towards. But do you feel from some of the other strategies of the shallow reading, hyper reading, skimming and scanning that we might have adapted from use of technologies, are the benefits to that or should we be seeking to address the skills and help our learners with that deep reading as the gold seal of approval? Mm. Um, I mean, it, it's tricky. I feel like there is value in being able to do both. Um, I don't think deep reading is going anywhere, even though there, there's certainly, I mean, with younger generations, like there are skills that seem to come more naturally than others, but um, yeah, there is a lot of stuff out there. So like if we're going into research mode or um, we don't even individually amongst um, like ourselves, we don't necessarily read all the things the same way. Um, I don't read a, you know, a, a research article or a book that I really need to study in the same way that I do, a, you, know, a, you know, a news article and these sort of things. So we evolve our own strategies. Um, I think deep reading and the kind of the immersive reading uh, and the historical context does help because it, it does sort of say it's like we've always been distracted readers like we just have there was no period when we we're just sort of like, you know, sitting like monks with books chained to the library walls and would only do that well 
the monks did, but um, like, you know, the, for everyone, the rest of us, like, you know, we always had our natural limitations for reading and these sort of things. Um, we do see some things, some indicators that for longer books of fiction, um, it seems like we enjoy them more when we're doing them in print and we kind of take it at our own pace and these sort of things. So maybe there's a slowing down, feeling immersed in these kind of things. Um, if we're truly losing the capacity for engaging in books long term, that simply doesn't explain why um, long books are still popular and actively read. We've got books by like Thomas Pinkett, or thousand pages. We've got all the Game of Thrones books, which are several hundred pages. So we can still do it. That hasn't gone away. If anything, I swear, like longer books are becoming more popular in some ways. So it's just interesting. I wonder if we're just being more selective now than we were before about what we choose to do deep reading on. Maybe that's not necessarily a bad thing. Maybe. Yeah, it's maybe, as you say, that strategy that we just need to cope and learn to read. We learn to read things in different ways for the purpose of our reading. So it's not, not completely losing that. Um, I can see that we've got uh, Laura here who's joined us on the panel. So I will hand over to Laura for her question first. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you so much for the amazing talk. Um, so uh, let's say that I have a bit of a concern. I always had this, that we are all losing this ability to deep read or focus and everything. And uh, I don't know, if you watch the movie Idiocracy, and uh -huh. it's about this dystopia where in 500 years, people are not able anymore to think or they're just pressing a button because technology is making everything so easy for us and uh, and it's kind of the it's almost like uh, using our laziness <laughs> and uh, i don't know i read also the book thinking fast and slow by daniel kahneman yeah. I don't know yeah. if I read that too. That's, um, also the point there is that uh, we need to engage and not just take you know answer the first in instinct in things so i always had this and you know as educator i find myself in the position where I want to know, okay, every, people want shorter videos, people like shorter sessions, people like shorter stuff and flashy and everything. On the other hand, I feel sometimes that that's, that doesn't necessarily teach so much. And I also think about the impact of this kind of um, uh, easier forms of communication. So I don't know if you have any thoughts about this, you know, kind of the trade off between, yes, people are going to click it, people are going to see it, but are they going to get something out of it? Or uh, uh, maybe we should actually ask people to make more of an effort and uh, obviously helping them, you know, with resources and, uh, and everything, but, you know, kind of not necessarily making things easy because easy is not always the solution to everything. Yeah, no, that's true. That's Thank a you really very good much. Time. I'm glad you asked that question because like, yeah, it is hard. Like, you know, attention span, because we're, used to it. And because these habits change gradually over time, um, the, our reading habits and our ways that we engage with content have changed so gradually with every update, every new device that we get. So um, it's hard to notice these things from what was different three, four, five, ten 10 years ago. Um, there's a book, and I think it kind of relates, but Cal Newport, who I think is really interesting, wrote a book called Deep Work. That sort of applies, it sort of applies to all the work that we do on an everyday basis, but some of it applies to deep reading too, because he essentially says uh, deep work and focusing, like truly focusing, is hard work, and we should feel tired at the end of it. And I was like, yeah, um, I think that's true. But he's basically saying is like, we have to treat it as something serious. Um, the number of times that I've heard, like when I was in uh, doing the PhD, people are like, oh, I worked like, you know, 10, 11, 12 hours a day. It's like, but I saw you on like WhatsApp and Instagram, like at least half of the time. I was like, that's not work. That's like, you know, half, half doing these things. So even kind of just like reconceptualizing what we think of as like what we choose to pay attention to is something to think about. Um, it is hard. And I think there are ways kind of when I was talking about the attention span stuff, like whether it's through just reading for the sheer sake of reading um, to kind of get ourselves lost in these things. I 100% believe that we can kind of uh, gain these habits and train our brains to do these things. It doesn't mean it's easy, um, but I do think um, it is something that can be worked on. It's something we should support in a larger sense. So now I'm kind of just like thinking like in a very general thing, what I've noticed in terms of attention span. So these are bigger picture questions. I'm not even talking about reading per se at this point, but at least in the last several years, I've noticed that in terms of like online discourse, 
Um, something has certainly changed, right? In terms of, we, we've heard all the stuff about polarization and all of these things. Some of that I do attribute directly to the, the, the format in which we're getting content, bite-sized little things, hot button headlines, these sort of things. That cartoon I shared was a little bit jokey, but also a little bit, um, people do get angry based on very little information now. I don't know when this happened. I think short attention spans um, aren't only just like a limiting factor, they're also potentially dangerous. Like I've noticed, and I worry about the fact that um, you know, the, the average person or the average conversation nowadays seems to be not just, I'm reading this and I disagree with it, more as like, I read a little bit of this and now I hate you as a person. Uh, when did this happen? When did this become a thing? Like, I feel like shorter attention spans has meant um, like, you know, kind of like we've lost a little bit of our capacity for empathy for the idea to kind of like tolerate, um, you know, things that are ambiguous or uncertain and all of that. So, yeah, I, that's that's a larger way to think about it. But there's a lot at stake. Yeah. And it, it came up in the chat, actually, that idea that now we're asking Twitter us if you've actually read the whole article mm -hmm. or share it and things like that. Is that in response to some of our polarized views and uh, sort of, you know, our reception of that reading and that kind of thing? Actually, there's a question in the um, on the questions that kind of relates to this kind of it's the use of technology that someone's posted here. Of how does your research on digital distraction kind of intersect with the kind of research on addiction and that kind of thing and I think that's some of the thing of that addiction links with the the use and the design of that attention uh, design that um, you were talking about in terms of the technology companies all competing for attention. Yeah this is a tough one and this is kind of more of a like a psychology neuroscience distinction but like I will say like it's tricky between addiction I guess dependence is a better way to describe it um, like it does feel like addiction at times because we certainly go through like withdrawal type symptoms if we ever try to just stop doing some of these things. But I think dependence is a better way to describe it in the sense that we talk about like, oh, I need to check Facebook. And I was like, well, I don't need to check Facebook. I can probably deal without it. But it's that sense of like, you know, um, we did another talk actually last month and I kind of just very generally called it internet points. And I was like, why do we need internet points? It's this virtual currency that keeps us coming back. And the amazing thing is, and this does come to the addiction part, is there are never enough internet points in the world. Um, I had this really good post um, and it got 50, uh, 50 likes. But you know what would be really good is 51 or 52 likes. That's just, it is the perfect mechanism for kind of keeping us hooked to these sort of things. So I wonder about that. Sometimes um, that is a form of dependency and it does feel like, um, I mean, gosh, Instagram for a while, um, they've been experimenting with hiding um, likes on videos and these sort of things rolling out to different countries because there were actually people who were suicidal when they're, you know, if you feel like this is your livelihood and you're an Instagram influencer, or whatever the hell that is. Um, but like when you're not getting the views, um, all of a sudden, like your, your, your sense of self is being uh, attacked. And I was like, oh, there's something wrong with me. I found I'm only getting half the number of views I used to look like. Um, that was clearly demonstrating some kind of harm in terms of like, this was how people were getting their sense of self-worth. Um, that's dangerous. That's very dangerous when it comes to like, you know, these sort of things. Um, what was the original question? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, it was of that, that combination with addiction, actually, if, yeah. if, if yours had inter intersected, your research had intersected with that. Yeah, I mean, I only come at it from the angle of in terms of like, you know, um, how much do you think about a post? How often do you check and refresh? And I've done that where it's sort of like, oh, this picture is really good. And it gets like two likes. And I was like, oh, oh, well, um, that's not how it works sometimes um, just because of the nature of social media. But um, so I'm interested in from kind of a psychological sort of like, what does it do to our sense of self, especially our online self, especially now when our online self feels like more of our real self since everything is online in the past year or so. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of a, a partial answer to that question is that I think it's, it, it's, it's certainly a kind of dependency and, um, it's not easy. It's not easy to disentangle from our, our habits. Um, I see, uh, Clemens is um, joining us. He's got a yeah. video. We'll invite Clemens. Would you like to? Yeah. Hi. 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 Very, very thought provoking ideas there. And I'm very grateful for you actually do just bringing in what what I wanted to raise, which is the the um, angle of um, addiction, but also the angle of, you know, uh, 
in the good old days, you could say you go to bed and nothing will happen. But of course, we are all connected. And it's just the sheer amount of uh, possibilities of um, having somebody, you know, in a different time zone, slagging you off or, yeah. or, or, or even making commented, positive comments about what you said. And you, you basically, the, 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 this pressure to, um, to take as much in. But I think the one thing which is really, really um, hitting us badly, and that goes back to the distraction bit which of what you said, you can probably never read enough yeah. Whereas before, when you had a book like, you know, I'm here in Cambridge as well, um, over the road, nine million books, okay, you could never read them, but everybody would accept that physically you couldn't actually deal with them. But now it comes on the screen and you could read like 30 articles, read 30 articles a day. Uh, and that would be quite easily possible. Whereas in the good old days, maybe, maybe in 20 years, 30 years ago, um, you would have find the journal, you would have opened it up, find it in there, that would take time, then go to the next bit of the shelf. So I think we are also suffering from something which, um, when I did my master's, um, somebody called infobesity. So we have too much, so much information that is actually to the grotesquely obese stage. Yeah. And we're all suffering from that because, you know, we're trying to cut things down. And um, it's so easy to then think, oh, I must get more of that and must get more of that and it's much more disciplined to actually say hang on a moment i'm actually going to focus on you know looking at the guardian or looking at the times or and and not anywhere else even so i could look you know um an american newspaper used today or wherever i, I could watch endlessly programs on that and i think um um that that is something i can see how our students suffer from that. It's not that they don't have enough to read, they have too much to read. And then giving them more digital can freak them out even more because they will never be able to read it properly. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I hope that makes sense. Oh, it totally makes sense. Yeah, I like I like the information obesity. I haven't heard that, but um, if anything, that highlights the kind of curatorial function of you as librarians and people in libraries have. Um, when I recommend books, like they're books that I've read and actually digested, I will just say like, oh, go read this thing that, you know, I just did a random Google search on. Like that is like library function is more important than ever now. Finding those trust, trusted, reliable sources so that people can cut through all of the noise. Um, and just being able to like teach students, like, you know, it's kind of an information literacy thing, but um, more like a, a 2021 version of information liter literacy. Uh, Gosh, I mean, uh, when I was at Google and working with like the news publishers and these sort of things, I mean, news is a, that's a tough industry to be in. Like their sole purpose is like get the clicks, get people to get the views, um, raise advertising revenues so they can stay in business and survive. Um, but the downside for us is that, I mean, come on, like half of the news isn't even new news. It's just sort of repackaged stuff. Um, when CNN first started in the 90s, the concept of a 20, 20, uh, 24 hour news cycle was just a thing they made up. Remember when the news used to be like morning and evening? That was the news. You find out the news in the morning and the evening. Now it's whenever we want all the time. Um, there isn't that much news on a given day. I mean, sometimes there are, but sometimes it's just kind of like we all fall into the trap. I did it during the presidential election, which stressed me the hell out. Um, but I was doing that. I was just reading every single thing. It's like, wait, is this new? Wait, it's not new. Uh, but it sounds new because they changed the headlines. So um, news industry is getting very good at that when it comes to just sort of like, you know, uh, that's why I feel like uh, some of the, the time things that I mentioned, like the iOS is, uh, shortcuts and like carving out reading time and a finite amount of reading time too, because we all do have a finite amount of reading time. And it's like, oh, I got to read these 300 articles in my um, saved a bookmark queue or something like that. I was like, I don't know. You know, like after a while, like it, it, we have to kind of do that information triage. We're all doing it now, too, is like, is this worth my time? Is it still timely? We're not going to be able to read any everything. Um, that's a hard question. The reading guilt thing is kind of like something I still deal with in terms of should. Should I read this? But we can't. Yeah, I think linked to this, actually, there's been a question in the chat, which is asking about that need for critical reading. And should we be looking at critical reading and that? Um, actually with the distractions has that undermined our ability to critically appraise what we're reading and is that something that we need to focus on um, as de democratic responsibility actually and so you mentioned the US elections and things like that yeah. is that should our focus uh, include that critical um, 
Yeah, and I mean, one way I could answer that question is saying that we're all in our, our filter bubble. So if you've heard the term of like, you know, a lot of the things that we, we vote with our clicks, that is the simplest way to describe it in terms of like when we are checking out news on social media, Twitter and Facebook, and all of these things, when you click on that, that is a vote for the essentially, essentially, I'm oversimplifying a little bit, but that's how you train the algorithm to say like, I like stuff like this, show me more stuff like this. Um, that's just how it works. Uh, we vote with our clicks and sometimes we have to be able to like, you know, um, step outside of our filter bubble. Um, uh, that's easier said than done, but sometimes that does mean looking at other sources that we don't necessarily agree with. Um, uh, it's, it's almost become like a, like, especially politics, this, this kind of weird team sport phenomenon. We see the stuff that we want to see for our team necessarily, but sometimes that we all have blind spots. We just, we have to admit that like, you know, we don't always see those things that don't always put our team in the best light. So we kind of have to look for, um, you know, BBC, uh, like, you know, is, is sometimes my go-to for objective things, but not everything. Al Jazeera, like I'll look at like having a, um, a, a healthy, diverse diet of news sources, I think is a way to go. Um, this is a big issue in itself. Like the idea of like kind of fake and polarized news and sort of like um, having these echo chamber things. Um, it's a big topic, but just knowing that like getting outside of our, our normal habits of information consumption can be a very good thing sometimes. Yeah. Um, on habits, you mentioned actually about that uh, idea of unlearning habits uh, and that kind of thing and I thought as we're nearing to close it might be a positive if, if you could share any tips on like sort of unlearning some of these habits where we might fall into digital distractions. Okay let's see um, one of my favorite ones that's helped me is um, kind of like quiet mornings and I did have to teach myself this I totally have the habit of just sort of like first thing in the morning basically just looking um, and checking social media or emails or news and all of these things. Um, I feel like that puts us in a really reactive state of mind. And it's not good for us either when you think about it. First thing in the morning before you've had your tea or coffee um, and you get the email that kind of stresses you out, it's like, ah, crap, I have to worry about this. But the problem with that is that uh, we're not really awake enough to like react on something. So instead, what we're doing is um, kind of like thinking about those things without while we're still waking up. I found quiet mornings to be something that's made my life a lot better, especially since pandemic. Um, you know, I, I fell in the same habit of kind of like, oh, I got to check the news. I got to see what's going on. Um, that was really hurting my well-being and mental state. So I just decided um, I used a habit app, actually. Um, there's a lot of free habit apps, but it's basically you can pick any habit and then you try to keep a streak going for as many days as you can. And that's what I did. I was sort of like, all right, 15, 20 minutes for like or 30 minutes of quiet time, my time or whether it's like leisure reading or jotting down my to-do list for these sort of things, not social media's time, not like news, news's time for these sort of things, but actually like carving out the silent thing. Um, gosh, I feel like, you know, carving out leisure reading time for yourself is like a gift to be able to do that and just sort of like it puts you in the right frame of mind. Um, that's one. The other one I'll say is like the, the opposite uh, turn is um, nighttime. Um, so that's the big one. Like the less social media we can like kind of use and consume before bedtime, the better off we're all going to be. Um, it keeps us up later. Some, some researchers at Cambridge are actually were doing some stuff on COVID nightmares, which I thought was really interesting. And that's the idea that because COVID is this, um, you know, kind of like amorphous, like abstract thing, like we would have more dreams that we're being chased by something because that's how our brains process like a threat and these sort of things. If we were reading more news um, on COVID stuff close to bedtime, and I was like, so it actually affects our quality of sleep, possibly our contents of our, our sleep and dreams and these sort of things. So limiting news and social media towards the end and being able to just end with a good book is probably better for us. Um, I'm not a health person, so I can't say that for sure, but that's, it's what I would prefer. It just gives us a chance to slow down. And thank you for that. I like that idea of like that quiet in the morning and then quiet in the evening as well, just that gives you that space, that gives you that time that is away from those distractions of the rest of the day. So thank you for sharing that.